Good evening and welcome. My name is Cindy Mabi and this is ANN7 Prime. My top story this hour, the public protector has referred the CIX report to the Special Investigative Unit for prosecution. The CIX report details illegal apartheid-era loans made by Bankop, which APSA later acquired. Reacting to the development, APSA says it is not obliged to pay any money back. Advocate Busisiwe Mkwebane released the public protector reports today. Mkwebane found reserve bank loans to APSA illegal and irregular. While partial repayments were made, there's still interest due in the amount of 1.25 billion rand, and the public protector found government, the reserve bank and treasury's conduct improper, and that it constitutes maladministration. The public protector found the allegation that government failed to implement the SIAC's report is substantiated. Two investigations, or rather two investigations, found the financial aid given to Bancorp and APSA was irregular. And the correct amount of the illegal gift granted to Bancorp APSA is 1.25 billion rand. And the South African Reserve Bank, in granting the financial aid, failed to comply with Section 101F and S of the Reserve Bank Act. And the Finance Ministry further failed in its duty to ensure the Reserve Bank compliance with Section 37 of the Reserve Bank Act. And the actions by government and the Reserve Bank constitute improper conduct and maladministration. According to our investigation, that's what we determined. Um, that uh, APSA, in fact, Bangkok was procured by APSA and we've gone through to APSA to check all the documents relating to the um, taking over by APSA from Bangkok. So, well, the report will detail all those issues to say why it's APSA which is accountable on the matter. I investigated the allegations uh, here uh, of, uh, we refer to this investigation as a, a CX a report which was compiled by a Mr. Michael Otley, who was contracted by the South African government to invest to assist in investigating and recovering misappropriated public funds and assets allegedly committed during the apartheid regime. The complainant was advocate Paul Hoffman, who alleged that a memorandum of agreement was signed between Billy Masetla on behalf of the government of the Republic of South Africa and Mr. Michael Otley on behalf of CX. Uh, in uh, October 1997, allowing CX to investigate and recover public funds on behalf of the government. He also alleged that what is of concern is part of the CX report that deals with a lifeboat allegedly afforded, afforded by way of an illegal gift by the South African Reserve Bank uh, to Bangkok Limited, now APSA Bank, during the apartheid regime. The complainant alleges that the government of the Republic of South Africa and the South African Reserve Bank failed to implement the CX report and to recover misappropriated money from Bangkok Limited without providing any reasons to that effect. Having considered the evidence uncovered during the investigation against the relevant regulatory framework, the public protector makes the following find findings. Whether the South African government improperly failed to implement the CX report, dealing with alleged stolen state funds after commissioning and uh, daily paying the same. The allegation whether the South African government improperly failed to implement the report is uh, substantiated. CX was paid 600,000 pounds, British pounds, for services which were never used by the South African government. No evidence could be found that any action was taken, especially specifically in pursuit of the CX report. Failure by the South African uh, government was inconsistent with the duties imposed, imposed by Section 195 of the Constitution, requiring a high standard of professional ethics. The failure was also inconsistent with Section 231 of the Constitution, that requires that all constitutional obligations must be performed diligently without delay. The failure of the South African government and uh, constitute improper conduct is in Section 182.1 of the Constitution and maladministration is in Section 6 of the Public Protector Act. The Public Protector has spoken. I think she's done an investigation and I think she has uh, uh, released her findings and I think people must comply with it. The Public Protector has made it very, very clear that even though some money is repaid, the transaction is were irregular 
and it has prejudiced all South Africans, and as a result, they must pay. And let's be honest, I think the banks must be treated like everybody else. Let us be mindful of the fact that EPSA Bank took over or purchased Bangkok. And when you do that, you take over with their assets, with their liabilities and everything that goes with. So if Bangkok was responsible and liable for this, then EPSA, by virtue of that, EPSA is now responsible for it. So they can't say that they don't have a right to pay or that they have paid or they settled the debt. How much we could have done with 1.1 billion rand 10, 15, 20 years ago. Can you imagine how much more we would have done in the country? Ministry of Finance did not ensure compliance. They, 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 which she goes on to say that they breached certain parts of the Constitution. And if you've just joined us, welcome to NN7 Prime. My name is Cindy Mabi. On the special edition, as you've heard, Advocate Busisi Mkwebane has now given her recommendations with regards to the SIEX report and to help us uh, unpack all these issues and where this matter is likely to go is Adil Nchabeleng. He is uh, the president of Transform RSA. We have Mosiri Tsiane, South African Liberty Foundation president or chairperson. Mzonele Manyi is with the Progressive Professionals Forum as their president. Sepo Khadima, political analyst. Analyst and Professor Andre Thomashausen, constitutional law expert. Yamgelas Pengane is a political analyst in Jabulo Nzuza, Secretary General of the ANC. And of course, you at home are most important panelists. We welcome you to the show. Gentlemen, good evening to you. I had to relinquish my seat to make room for our esteemed panelists. But uh, let's start with you, Professor Thomashausen. When we look at the Constitution, considering that this matter is long standing with the SIEX report, what are the chances that it will see the light of day? That is really the big and essential question, um, because of course those who stand to, to lose as a result of the rediscovery of the Sykes report, the Sykes report is from 1997, 1998, uh, they will argue that most of these claims have prescribed, that they were never followed up, um, that the state did nothing to recover that money for whatever reasons. And, um, and that, like any other liability, they may have prescribed. Uh, even in criminal prosecution terms, um, some of the minor offenses may, may no, it may no longer be possible to, to prosecute them. If, if that technicality can be overcome, <clears throat> then there will be other very complex issues, such as the, uh, the question of uh, succession uh, between what was called Bank Corp and what is now called APSA Bank. Um, APSA Bank may argue that it is not liable for what happened to, to an institution that existed before APSA came into being. And then, of course, um, the Reserve Bank uh, condoned all these actions, and uh, that could be argued um, uh, constituting a pardon. It could be argued as an acquiescence. Uh, the pressure, the public pressure, and maybe also international pressure, will nevertheless be considerable. Mm. Because in total, we're not just talking a few billion rand. Um, the CX report that has always been available was widely covered in the press in 2010, in Nose Week. Um, that report uh, came to conclude that about 240 to 260 billion US dollar had disappeared. So basically, this is the real sunset. This is the enormous amount of money that um, the apartheid leadership, the apartheid elites secured mm. in offshore accounts, in obscure destinations, uh, to, to have a very comfortable sunset. And that is a huge international scandal because, of course, they couldn't have acted alone. They needed major institutions, major powerful politicians to help them along. We can understand and appreciate that there's a grander scale in terms of uh, apartheid corruption, if you will, primarily after uh, 1976 going forward. But do you think Advocate Mkwebane had preempted that there could be a glitch or technicality by saying or calling for a, uh, a change in reform uh, or legislation, rather, in dealing with this matter, Tepo? Look, I think uh, the, the inquiry, uh, so as to speak, was very narrow and very limited. And if anything, we actually need to go a lot more broader if we were to take the CX report, which cost South African taxpayers 600,000 uh, British pounds. Therefore, it means that we need to look at everything else, not just this narrow matter. But on this narrow matter of uh, APSA having to pay the 1.1 billion rent is now so determined by the public protector, uh, I don't see how that money or, or how APSA can actually plead prescription 
more so because uh, they have been entertaining. They've never once um, advanced any evidence uh, or pleaded prescription during the public protector's uh, investigation and in those uh, uh, <coughs> decisions. So I think that this is just the beginning. But what we are seeing really, I think we have to see it in the much more larger, uh, broader context. If anything, we are seeing that corporate South Africa and the largest banks, if we had the institutionalized corruption, mm -hmm. that is where it really sits. But also, if we had institutions that do not respect the rule of law, it's large corporations and so helped by the banking institutions that have just far, become far too powerful. If you see the statement that came out today from APSA that never advanced any legal uh, arguments howsoever as to why they deem not to be owing this money, uh, that should be a cause for worry. And also let's bear in mind that, by the way, this has been out there. We have Henny Van Fieren who just released a book recently. In 2006, he wrote a very detailed uh, expose on the apartheid grand corruption, and nothing was taken, was done about that. We have uh, uh, Bob Aldworth, the late Bob Aldworth, who also, again, wrote a book, The Infernal Tower. And when you read The Infernal Tower, you'll again realize that uh, there is absolutely no way that APSA, or anyone for that matter, could sustain any mm -hmm. argument that the money is not due and payable. But if anything, we have to go a lot more broader. And therefore, the issue of a, a much larger judicial commission of inquiry couldn't be more timely. Today, we have proved that uh, it in, indeed so. Yeah. Organizations like yourself, the uh, Progressive Professionals Forum, including SELF and uh, BLF and Zonella, would you say you vindicated or was it too early to, to make a call? Yeah, I think just before we get to that, yes, indeed, we have vindicated. Uh, on a number of fronts, by the way. But before we even get there, I think let's just kill the issue of uh, prescription here. I don't think the issue of prescription actually applies because we don't actually have a delinquent debt here. We have a situation of maladministration, of debt that should have been collected but was not collected. So it will not meet the requirements for it to be a deemed uh, a debt that has prescribed because due to maladministration, it was not called uh, as it were. So this is why. This is why we have the public protector saying the government was at fault. It was irregular, did not act properly. I agree with her. Uh, uh, people like Trevor Manuel, who uh, misled the government and said things mustn't happen and all of this. That's all part of my administration that the people must uh, uh, come to. In terms of vindication, yes, indeed. You must remember the first point of vindication for us is uh, decolonization foundation, in fact, uh, as well is to say that we had said that uh, Tulema Donzela is, not, is a biased, pro-white monopoly capital uh, public protector. And, and this just shows that, uh, indeed, uh, if it was up to her, she would have swept this under the carpet. <coughs> this report was near finish, uh, but instead she just dumped it and she rushed to do this incomplete final job. Uh, is it too? So, but to her defense, she could say at least some work had been done, an investigation uh, yeah. had been put uh, in, in place, albeit that it wasn't concluded. Yeah, but indeed, that is very important, not concluded, but a, a, a near-finished job like this, because what would have happened, it would have been concluded, and some reasons, clearly, would have been found not to, uh, to make sure that this thing, this thing happened. So mm -hmm. I think for us, I think the very important thing that we have not said on this program is to congratulate Advocate Mkwebane yes, for the sterling work that she has done. I think what this does, by the way, uh, also it vindicates the ANC NEC position that says that uh, this probe must be broadened uh, so that uh, a lot more other uh, uh, capturers uh, can, be, uh, can come into the net. So we've got APSA now. Uh, I'm sure there are a few others. I mean, Remgro uh, is also mentioned in this report. Uh, so we're hoping uh, that uh, Rupert must also come and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and sing for his sins. Yeah, we appreciate the uh, public protector's findings and uh, recommendations are binding, but of course you can also expect a backlash <coughs> from those that are implicated in this report. Uh, and how that, you know, how will she circumvent that is, is, is for her office to decide. But we know there are issues of resources, issues of inadequate uh, uh, resources, so, so to speak, uh, in that office. Do you think this, again, will, will come to some sort of a conclusion? We've had many investigations, many um, judicial inquiries, etc., that have never come to a favorable conclusion, if you will. Jabul. 
Well, firstly, uh, I just want to deal with one thing. APSA cannot claim not to be liable. They are the ones who will have instructed the firm to do a due diligence on bank op before they bought it. Because primarily so when you buy an institution or a company, you take over both its benefits, also its liabilities. Therefore, APSA can come here in front of us and want to say, I take uh, benefits uh, from bank op, but I'm not taking liabilities. It is purely wrong. It cannot be accepted. And we are very vindicated today, standing here, because APSA thought this matter is just a small matter. In fact, they were very sarcastic in the response they gave to the ANC Youth League, thinking that they are mighty and powerful. And moving from now on, we are going to prove to them that they are not all so mighty and powerful. They are all expected to bow before the law. People last year, they were celebrating holding constitutions, saying the public protector's uh, <clears throat> findings are actually binding. Where are they today? Probably they are sleeping in their beds. They are no longer waving those constitutions and saying, yes, a large institution can also, in this democratic South Africa, be fined. So we, 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 can't, we, we really can't take that. Yeah, I think it brings me to the point why the public protector would deem it necessary to make a point that this is not politically motivated, mm -hmm. that this is, is, is all in the course of her duties in investigating complaints that have brought uh, to her. Why, why do you think, Yamgela, she would have had to make that declaration? Uh, the problem here is that uh, we have had uh, an issue of people coming into public office and being deemed to be aligned to a certain faction or to certain political figure. And therefore, when they conduct their uh, uh, stipulated constitutional duties, uh, then it is said if it's unfavorable to a certain group that they are pushing political agendas. And in the case of the public protector, because uh, Tulima Tonzela was seen as uh, pushing certain duties uh, for a certain faction, they want now uh, to label O Mambusim Kwebani as also uh, pushing certain agendas through her findings. But we will remember that these things that she found, like especially the APSA uh, SIAX report, <coughs> is something that predates her, her coming into office as an incumbent public protector by, by a good two decades even. Because uh, it's something that was brought up during Kodesa, it's something that people brought up in 97, in 2000, uh, Tito Mboweni, when he was governor of the Reserve Bank, this thing sat in front of him and he knows about it. People like Jill Marcus knew about it at their during their tenure as, as governors of the Reserve Bank and it's nothing new. And we are saying that it, it should just be a tip of an iceberg because there are a lot of cover-ups and crimes that happened during that transition into democracy. Uh, that whole sunset uh, era that, that took billions in the billions of rand that actually disappeared. And and uh, being international financial flows and the position of, of all international organizations on illicit financial flows being that they should be curbed as they have taken and they've stolen from the development of Africa. It's something that needs international reaction. It's something that needs to be harnessed right now. And this is exemplary to say APSA should pay as an offender uh, to international agreed upon statutes that to, to foresee sustainable development goals, things like illicit financial flows need to be harnessed so that the developing world can actually retain its capital and be able to employ it to things that will help it develop. And now 1.125 billion rand is a lot of money that we can use in the fiscal <coughs> and as such, the findings of the public prepare protector are binding and we want to see them being carried out. Mm. The significance a deal of uh, this particular action from the public protector and especially in digging up mm. uh, the grand scale of corruption uh, during the apartheid years. Look, uh, the, the significance is one. We, we had one, the changeover of one public protector to the new public protector. And over the past few months, if you could listen to the criticism of the incoming public protector actually weighed against her, has today actually placed her in a far much more stronger position. Let's go back and understand what actually took place. 26 billion was reported by the CIX report that said very clearly that money was looted out of the South African Reserve Bank. How was that money looted? Various organizations, there were five organizations, which APSA was one of them, who were given special money as a rescue package, as an aid package, in order to assist them
to survive through that period of turmoil and actually going through that time. Then APSA comes in and acquires this particular in, uh, organization called the Bangkok and acquires it with its asset. And particularly, those assets included the money and the cash that they had already received from the Reserve Bank. Then you come to what we are looking at today. APSA making a refusal and making a blatant, reckless statement that it's not going to pay back that money clearly indicates that we have a rogue corporation in South Africa. APSA had made a fundamental mistake. One is, this is a bank that banks over 11 million South Africans. Secondly is, it's a bank that not long ago, a year ago, if you remember or so, Barclays was busy running quickly to untangle its shares and assets into the APSA particular ownership. Why were they doing that? It means they had already knowledge of what was to come. So as a result, we're sitting in a situation whereby today, there already has been an order to say that penalties must be paid, the money must be recouped back into the South African uh, Treasury Fund, as well as the government. But we need a functional government. The Minister of Treasury today should have been sitting and asking himself the question, what do we do in a given situation like this? One of the things that the minister should be doing is to say, we already have identified that we have money in APSA. South Africa is looking at a state bank model. Here we have a bank that already owes us money, which took from the Reserve Bank. That should have been already the strategy to go forward and say, let's start talking and engaging with this bank, engage with the other structures to say, now how do we make sure that we resolve this issue? APSA is an entity governed by the South African law. It cannot come back and tell the South African people that they are not interested in paying and they are not going to pay, unless they are, revol they are actually going against their constitution, unless they are prepared to actually be waged a civil revolt against them, and on the issue of the penalties that have already been spoken about. So, you know, nobody's going to get scot free here. Yeah. There's a suit but, to but say. It's a legal, sorry, it's, it's a legal entity, and uh, the uh, predecessors or those that were in the ex -co could argue that, you know, during their tenure they tried to do something, give some a lame excuse and move forward. So there's that degree of separation where they say, you know, it wasn't during my time and move on. It's the same with the land issue. Land was taken and stolen from South Africa. Are we going to tell people that since the land was taken, we cannot recover it back again? That's the same thing. We cannot now start <coughs> recusing ourselves from responsibilities. The minute they inherited the bank corp, they knew the liabilities, they knew the asset, they knew the responsibility. It is upon them now to take on the step of saying then how do we correct this mistake? In this case, there is a Sutu saying that says molato haoboli. Meaning what? A crime never rots. But the important thing though is that we're dealing with APSA, the entity. Mm. We're not dealing with individuals. Yeah. Even if the whole entire management can be fired today, the liability still stays because we're dealing with APSA, the entity. By the way, I wanted to add that in fact this 26 billion we're talking about is the recoverable amount. The actual amount is 200 billion. Uh, that was actually stolen. Mm. So this 26 billion is just a compromised position, by the way, so that South Africans must know that this country has been ripped off by uh, these uh, upsides of this world uh, as it is. No, but we've seen impunity as well with certain uh, former presidents under the apartheid government now wanting to dictate on uh, what uh, ethics and leadership is all about. Where I'm going with this, Professor Thomas Hausen, is how people can hide or, or their responsibility using not only the constitution, the law, and, uh, and, and selective amnesia. Well, the one sad conclusion is that <clears throat> probably the entire Truth Commission process was a smokescreen. The, the real crimes were, were not revealed. And it is quite significant that in January 1998, uh, a, a meeting of, of all the senior cabinet ministers, Dula Omar was there, Tito Mweni was there, Trevor Manuel was there, Alec Irvin was there, discussed the CX report. And a few months later, uh, the arms deal was signed. And there is a trade-off here that the world said, listen, don't ask us for $240 billion, not rand, billion dollars. This is about the gross domestic product of, of South Africa. Uh, don't ask us to give this back because it could collapse the entire Swiss banking system. We don't have that money. Uh, we'll, we'll give you some arms and we'll make you, we'll make you a member of the elite club. You, you can sit at the table with a G8 and you can feel important. And, and you'll be one of us and we'll integrate your little country into our worldwide uh, distribution of labor and opportunities and industrial manufacturing. So there was a political decision, obviously, to go that way, not to rock the boat. Without, without disrupting you, what is just described 
is the macro capture of South Africa. This is when it happened. People are talking about state capture in a very superficial terms. This is the uh, capture that uh, South Africa has been under since day one. Please proceed, Prof. Well, the thing is that there is a lot that has happened around this issue. It's also very significant that the man responsible for the SAIX report, he only took a year to get the facts all together. He's one of the most senior intelligence people in, in, in the UK. He's the man responsible for the peace in Northern Ireland. And Mr. Oatley, he's, he's quite an exceptional personality. That after the, the January 1998 meeting where the South African top leadership decided not to pursue the SAIX report, not to ask for monies to be paid back, that he then actually joined and offered his services to the reparations campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people internationally who said uh, big corporates who, who helped on apartheid, who enabled the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. they should pay reparations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big motor corporations mm -hmm. who delivered the gearboxes for the vehicles that were running around in the townships killing people, that they should pay reparations uh, because this was a crime against humanity and everybody aided and abetted it. Most members of the UN, UN Security Council were supplying arms to South Africa. So this reparations discussion also got nowhere. Mm. It is, it is, and it is to over. And to what the professor is saying regarding that whole reparations thing is that uh, right now we have uh, a t an entanglement of, of Glencore and and ESCOM and Tegeta and whatnot. But uh, where Glencoe actually comes from, that how Glencoe actually made his fortune, uh, and Mark Rich, the founder of Glencoe, actually speaks uh, that his, his most important relationship, his most important was that uh, he had a relationship to supply oil from Iran to, to apartheid South Africa. Now, apartheid South Africa being embargoed mean that they could not access international oil. And Sasso, being found to actually supply oil was in deficit. They could only manage about 40%. The rest had to come from someone. And that relationship that Mark Rich have, had is what made Glencoe one of the biggest companies in the world today because actually in the top 10 of the biggest companies in the world today as ranked by Fortune. Now, when you revisit where Glencoe comes from, and actually it was the oiling machine behind apartheid South Africa. Without oil, which is the energy backbone of the country from the 70s through to the 90s, apartheid could have collapsed much sooner than it did. Mm. But that, because Mark Rich was actually in the top 10 FBI's most wanted people until the 19th of January 2001, when Bill, Bill Clinton, on his last day of office, issued a presidential pardon for this man. Now, this company is founded by one, a person who was a wanted criminal for the most of his life, and we actually have this company at the center of at one of the biggest energy talks in the country. No one is bringing it to book to say, answer here, what is the problem? Where do you but come exactly, from? That, that is exactly the, the level of protection that we're talking about or questioning that how then are you going to recover what seems to be economic sunset clauses yeah. uh, that yeah. protects these uh, organizations? Because the problem here is that in 1994, when we only took over political freedom, mm -hmm. those who ran away literally with the whole of our economy and kept it for themselves, thought this day will never come. Mm -hmm. When we will actually grow and say, no, 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 no. In 1994, we only got nothing but a dummy. Now we want the whole of the pie in order for it to be shared equally amongst the people. And that is why you see so much aggressiveness towards those who speak about the land question, to those who speak about the apartheid debt, to those who speak about white monopoly capital having captured South Africa. What we have here is white monopoly capital that is very arrogant. These people are very arrogant, make no mistake about it, because they believe that they are untouchable. And that is why APSA is behaving in the manner in which it is behaving. Because here we are going to be setting an example. If APSA collapses, then it opens way for us to go back and say, wait a minute, that land that you are sitting on there was wrongly uh, taken and therefore it must come back to the people. So APSA should be used as an example that we want our economy back and it's going to start now. Right now we have a deficit. How are we supposed to finance this deficit? We are supposed to be taking this money and financing this deficit and using it to change the lives of our people at the ground. To me, it's about what we do from now moving forward. And the ANC Youth League is committed to fight APSA head on. We will continue to take them head on till they collapse.
Okay, rhetorical question. Why does this not make it into the public discourse, uh, considering the impact that it will have in changing the lives of the majority of poor black people? Well, it, I think it's very simple. It tells you that he who controls the media, mm -hmm. the mainstream media, doesn't want this to come uh, out. But, but by and large, it says that it, it, it's very clear that somebody else is with somebody else in bed. Would it have been any other? It would have been headlines all over in, in any news station, in every news paper. But because these involve their partners in crime, yes. now you have this deafening silence. You, you cannot. This is the biggest crime against mm -hmm. South Africans. It's not, it's not just the mere numbers of billions, one million. These affect everybody. The students who could not go to school, mm -hmm. the townships that are built, the lives that black people live every day, this, this desperation that we find ourselves in is because of the crimes that have been committed against us. The biggest holocaust of all time against the black South Africans. And yet you have quietness. You have people who don't want to talk about this. This is by any other mathematical calculations the biggest crime against humanity. One could argue that our custodians or father of our democracies should, or democracy, should be held equally liable because they were sitting around the negotiating table. They could have opted uh, to do the selfless thing by being more inclusive of how black people are going to be uh, uh, um, rewarded, if you will, for, for the strife and struggle that uh, we've gone through. Sample. Look, today we have a government that is in power. I think what South Africans need to be asking themselves a question is that for how long will they tolerate a timid government? A government that seemingly is docile on all matters that are important. It is not sufficient grounds to always be blaming others. If the state machinery sits where we believe it sits by a government that was democratically elected, mm -hmm based on the rule of law in terms of the supreme law of the land being the constitution, I just cannot see how long we can continue to make excuses for the people that are in uh, office today. So we need to be asking hard questions. Armed with what they have, what are they going to do? Why are they continuing to kotow to the poho of these imperialists that have plundered this nation? What we are sitting with here is not just a question of monies that are recoverable, but we are actually sitting with uh, criminal activity that has to be prosecuted in the criminal, uh, within our criminal justice system, and people have to be jailed. We have seen what the, um, in Germany, with, uh, during the time of Adolf Hitler, uh, even years later, 40, 50 years later, people were still being prosecuted for their crimes during that era. How can it be that today people can be saying here, justifying criminality and saying, let the bygones be bygones, we are a, a rainbow nation. But I am worried, exceedingly worried, that despite the evidence that is there, despite the fact that uh, many others, patriotic South Africans, have written at length and risked their own lives in exposing this colossal corruption, we seem to be completely doing nothing about it. And it's not just APSA, by the way. We know a few years ago, FNB owned, uh, First National Bank owned a private bank, Ansbacher, that illicitly moved 2.8 billion rand of private people uh, offshore, and they were never prosecuted. And today they are the very same executives that can stand up and tell us that you know, they are the paragon of all things acceptable. This has to stop. The government, those that are in office, whether they are within the criminal justice system, whether is in the executive, they need to stop and say, here and no further. They cannot continue to you know, hide behind that there is due process that must be observed. But they need to state and say they have been elected, they have been appointed into those positions to do nothing but to uphold the rule of law. Will they tell South Africans that they will now uphold the rule of law? Are we likely to see that demeanor? Well, I don't, here's the issue. I think, I think what this indicates is the level of capture of this government by white monopoly capital. The government is in a very invidious position. If it moves in a way that Sepo is suggesting, the strings are going to be pulled. You must remember, 
that, uh, I mean, you look at an example. Here's, here's an example. We appoint a minister of finance. Where does he go first thing? Mm. To go and say nothing is going to change. London, he goes to London okay. uh, mm. and all these places. He goes to the US and so on to say, oh, nothing is going to change. That shows the level of capture, the level of being manipulated by the rating agencies and all the people that we owe money to. Uh, as it is. So I think let's, uh, let's just understand that in the first place, that we have a government that is not operating uh, a, a, on a blank check situation. Or it's independently. A it's a government, and if it, I mean, you look at, at the simple thing of if the, uh, President Zuma did not get permission from White Monopoly Capital to appoint uh, Minister Kigaba, and you've seen the consequences of that, and we're still living through that, they are still fighting back uh, as it were even today. So I think, I think uh, as much as more could be done by government, but I think let's just understand that the government is working under very difficult conditions mm -hmm. because we owe two trillion rand uh, elsewhere. So. So government must Cash act, but there's yeah. some realities I, I, that I must think, take you know, the account. question, just in very simple terms, how do we then achieve the radical economic transformation if you're saying that uh, government's hands are bound, uh, there's the constitution on one side, still largely protecting uh, uh, white privilege, if, if you want to call it that. How then do we say to our people, the time is now for the second transition, your time is... is, is let right me close by saying, for, let me for close you by to, saying, to in benefit. fact, this is the right time, because right now, can't get any worse. We are in the junk status, uh, the rent has taken a knock, uh, and, 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 and so on. So this is actually the time. If government, it's now or never, this is why even with the Manning Charter, that for us as Progressive Professors Forum were saying that the Minister of Minerals uh, should not back down. He must in fact look at increasing that 30% to a, high, a higher number. This is the time. All the chips are down now, we've got the highest unemployment, it can't get any worse than it is now. So if you don't do it now, in banking terms, they call it the big path. If you've got such a situation, just go for it and just do everything that you could. So this is the time. If government doesn't move now, then it would have been sold out. What was the stock market, or rather the performance of the APSA share this afternoon when Advocate Mkwebane made the announcement? Adil, I think you're watching that very closely. <laughs> Look, the stocks actually, the APSA stock took a bit of a chilling. It uh, went down from its original position, and I think it lost about 0.2% uh, given uh, the numbers. And uh, what is actually strange, you know, the, the numbers are indicating that APSA's capitalization right now is sitting at 3.675 billion in terms of capitalization. And the report says that the, you know, APSA must pay back that 1.1 billion. Actual amount is about 3 billion. So if we were to really start looking at this matter seriously and strategically, we should be saying to APSA, since you have benefited unduly, this is your time with all the other banks and all the other culprits that benefited. This is your time now to actually ready yourself for the call of radical economic transformation. Mm. What it does it mean? It means that they must make the assets available. They must make the institutions part of the policy that we are currently talking about, which is radical economic transformation. You're sitting here with a panel of men who are already in their middle ages. Some are still in the youth age and who are saying very clearly and succinctly that we need to change the economy, we need to change the patterns of ownership in South Africa, and to do so, it means we have to start interrogating everything that has already gone through. The CIX report has not even gone deeper. People on really various levels, I will encourage everybody to take the time and read it. It's available online, it's a PDF, you can read and go through it. It's not a made-up report, it's not <coughs> something that people are making up. But what is even of essence is, over three thousand tons of gold was removed from the South African Reserve Bank, including diamonds. It's part of what is included in that particular report. So if that amount of money can be repatriated back into South Africa, we will be sitting in a far much more favorable position in terms of sorting out our debt situation, our obligations towards our, uh, what do you call it, uh, creditors right now, and the South African economy will instantly take an improving position. So this whole issue that the markets are dictating to us and telling us things that they know for sure that they are responsible for us to end. Yeah, but Professor Thomas Hausen, I think the detail mm -hmm. uh, or the devil is in the detail. It's in the how uh, and systematically, of course, within the confines of the law uh, and not to upset our strategic partners globally. It's in the how we... we uh, achieve uh, the aspirations of the majority black and, and redressing issues of the past. Of course, um, and, and I think I can come back to the, to the idea of the strings. 
it's, it's not just a puppet master and there's a puppet hanging on a few strings. Um, we, we live in a completely integrated global economy, especially the banking world is integrated. So there are strings that crisscross everywhere. <clears throat> if we try and break out of this, we can very quickly end up like Venezuela. And it can get a lot worse. It can come to the point where the petrol <coughs> stations are empty and uh, where the banks have shut down. And like in Venezuela, where young women are actually shaving their head to sell their hair to Chinese traders to be able to buy some food. So we, we should not go down this road. Um, this is a price for justice which is simply too high. So a lot has to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. A lot of leverage can be brought to the table. Proceeds of crime can always be forfeited. And we have legislation to that effect and the rest of the countries in the world have legislation to that effect. The, the, the gold that was mentioned uh, that was exported illegally by <coughs> under-accounting for the gold production. There's a huge discrepancy between the gold production from the mines who have to sell it to the Reserve Bank and what the Reserve Bank has actually sold. So there's thousands of tons that are missing. Uh, this is plain simple theft. That can come back. We can claim it. Let me share counter to this. Yes. We cannot have a situation mm. where yeah. people steal and steal and steal uh, and from there we'll say let's forget about it because otherwise we're going to have bread tomorrow. I think what should happen is that the thieves must be called out mm. first and foremost that these are thieves and then we must have a, a clear system of how to recoup from the thieves and they don't have to pay it now. We can have a nice annuity income from these thieves uh, mm. as they pay back mm. their, their, their obligations. Imagine if we're to say to this uh, a rogue banking sector because of what you've been doing all these years, this is how much you owe South Africa, how many billions, mm -hmm. and that, will, that could be uh, even dedicated to fees must fall. And then you look at the rest of the other uh, thugs in the, in the country, uh, in the mining, uh, in the telecoms industry, in the construction se sector, all these thugs that have been stealing money, there is no way uh, that in South Africa we should have a situation where we have a peace deal. You cannot negotiate with crooks what you should do we should be very clear and very firm on this matter that we are going to determine how much these crooks owe the country yes. and then the only discussion we're going to have are the, are the repayment the terms. Yeah, That's uh, do we need an active citizenry as well? Sorry, uh, Professor Thomas Hauser, because like you were saying, we, we essentially cornered or with the uh, um, sunset clauses or rather CODESA painted ourselves into a corner in favor of a reconciliation which was necessary. Now comes to the money, which uh, is most likely to, to create uh, even further unrest uh, and difficulties in how we negotiate this, this, this transition. What are we, we saying we can negotiate active citizenry? I, I need some practical no. I think well, we must not, no. uh, we must not confuse what issues. We we, look, the issue of what is at hand right now is these people are living very well. We are not talking about poor yeah. institutions. We are not talking about poor individuals. We are not talking about poor banks here. We're talking about institutions that have money, that must be made to understand that laws apply and apply equally to everyone. Because if you're saying that there must be a pattern for corporate uh, crime and theft, and then on the other side then you're saying that there must be punishment for petty crimes, what are we creating in the between? So we have to be very clear and serious about this matter. Mm. We, we have but one the, legal... The other problem that we're dealing with here is that the financial sector, if we're saying they must go unpunished, it means they must then continue with these crimes. They have been playing around with the rent. Competition Commission comes up and says, hey, the financial sector has been colluding. Mm -hmm. There are books written on this issue, like the assault on the rent. Nobody acts on them. They go further. They want to dictate how you must actually run an, 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 a country. You must run a country wherein they must continue to make money. Exactly. And the poor which in majority vote for the governing organization, which is the ANC, must continue and be in poverty. And then we say, no, 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 because these ones, they will collapse our economy, which they will do on their own terms. Therefore, let us not require them to pay back any money. Let us just let go of them. No, the reason why we are saying now, government must now move their money that they've been banking with APSA 
yeah. as a primary banker and move it towards the establishment of a state-owned bank that will invest in the future of this country. That will not collapse the country if we mm. move the money, put it in a state bank, and as a result, use that money to invest in the future of this country. We still do have other banks. If those other banks haven't done anything wrong, yes, then you leave them alone. But those who have been found to have done something wrong, no, 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 it can't. They're all can, they, can they be compelled to do so? I mean, it's one thing to call for it, or, or maybe to... Uh, uh, call for for them to apply their conscience or, or do the right thing. That's, Ten, that's well, never going to happen. There is a what order is what you need. Exactly. There's a, so there's a the legal mechanism. Civil action. Legal. If, yeah. if, you, if you claim, if you have a claim against APSA, which, uh, which is equivalent to their asset base, to the value of their asset, yeah. then they're insolvent. Exactly. And then they need another bailout, like, uh, like we've had it in Europe. And the consequence of modern bailouts is that they have to surrender their equity. Mm -hmm. So they become automatically nationalized. You take because the government, the, 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 the Reserve yeah. Bank, will take over the equity. Exactly. Then the government the uses that infrastructure arising from that equity and the assets to do what? To create a to nature bank. To operate a state-owned bank yeah. that well, has infrastructure. to have a transformed court. bank. To have exactly. a transformed bank. So is right, we do have the solution. This, are these the, the, the <coughs> suggestions or recommendations that are in the near future or something that can be uh, applied? We saw the public protector still calling for the special investigative unit to further probe uh, and for, for APSA to pay back the money. That in itself is probably going to be Good a on. lengthy process. Uh, but now that the, the public protector has thrown the ball into the court, we, we, we await the, the, the special investigations unit to actually probe further into the details. But now, it, there are legal mechanisms to then institute a way for APSA to actually pay back uh, whatever is deemed to be the amount, be it that 1.125 uh, billion. billion rand or whatever is the amount. And, uh, we are also saying that it should not be limited to APSA because uh, we cannot postpone the reparations that are due to people. We cannot postpone what, because uh, as, as Tepo mentioned earlier, uh, in 2010, Germany paid the last installment of the 1919 uh, Treaty of Versailles uh, fine. They, they actually were, were, were supposed to pay uh, from 1919 and they paid it in installments yeah. up to 2010. Now, if it can take you 99 years, to pay a debt that was done in, in, in the early 20th century. Apartheid ended in 1994. And uh, who, who said that we are not due for reparations? We are not due for the, for the biggest crimes against humanity <coughs> known in human history? Because no one ever, ever calls out the Jews for, for, for pulling at the Holocaust, something that lasted for, for six years. Mm -hmm. And here we are, we had people being instituted under a regime that saw them as less than human for a full 40 years. No one is calling that. So, out. so you, yeah, this would be applicable to industry, or, or rather, uh, means of production, or whoever has the wealth currently. Are we looking at corporations? Are we looking at state-owned entities? What are we looking at precisely? Well, I, I think a practical approach would be, if if any one of us had the bad fortune of buying a stolen car, and and the police come and find the car, they will take <coughs> that car away, and we won't get the money back that we paid for that stolen car. So, if we find that 3,000 tons of gold are lying somewhere that were stolen, we can just mm. take them take back. The best. Yeah. Mm. And it's, it's, uh, we can recover things that were stolen, mm. and maybe this is where we need the further investigation to clarify, because apparently much more happened than just the 3,000 tons of gold. Yep. Yep. But so, the other much more uh, logical thing to do, in fact, which I would advise the ANC to do, mm. is to look at the Constitution, because uh, most of the things that we want to do we might have certain constitutional constraints. This is why even Advocate McCurban is also making, uh, making proposals in that regard. I think the ANC, if the ANC wants to get 75% uh, in 2019, the ANC has to uh, admit that uh, the compromises that were made in the Constitution uh, have come back to haunt us. It's time. Uh, for all the sun, mm. sunset clauses to become sunrise clauses. Mm. Uh, the sooner the ANC does yeah. that, the better. So, sorry, Njabula. Just before we, we go, we did get an earlier reaction from the president of Black First Land First, Andy Lemkotama, on the announcement by, by the public protector uh, to go after the money that is due to the citizens of this country. And this is what he had to say. Our view is that the public protector has vindicated exactly our position. Uh, Black First Land First has been saying that uh, there is uh, massive corruption that has happened under apartheid and has continued to happen today, uh, mainly uh, perpetrated by white monopoly capital or white businesses, and they are looting the state because they have captured the state. 
and uh, this money remember it's part of the 26 billion rand which was stolen from the south african reserve bank meaning that that money was stolen from the people of south africa and for very long time me, uh, former ministers such as uh, uh, pravin godan uh, uh, trevor manuel including even somebody like tito mboweni have been refusing to take seriously the cix report despite the fact that the cix report was uh, funded or paid for and commissioned by the post-1994 government uh, of, of democracy. Today, we have indicated the public protector says that APSA must pay back the money. We are saying APSA must pay back the money. APSA is just one of the more than uh, five entities which are directly implicated in the 26 billion rand which was stolen from the reserve bank part of which uh, implicates directly uh, johan rupert and his late father anton rupert who also benefited billions of rand from uh, this uh, corruption we do not want to have a big uh, uh, quabbling with the uh, public protector we believe apsa owes more money but we want them to pay this which has been called by the public protector once that has been done will be able to enter into further conversations about what more they must pay including the fact that uh, the net bank must pay the johan rupert's family must pay the demla chrysler must pay and other individuals which are associated or were associated with apartheid and this massive corruption must pay back the money so we're very very pleased that this decision has been made and as you as society may know blf was one of those organizations right at the beginning when the former public protector had put the matter under the table we came up we said this uh, money stolen by apsa and others must be investigated we were arrested we went to jail slept in jail for more than eight days we are still out on bail demanding action on this question and today we're being vindicated we think it's the beginning of a process to help our people understand corruption in south africa massive corruption that include billions of rand is a wide a business it's what white monopoly capital does and up to now they've been protected by ministers such as Pravin Godan, Trevor Manuel, Tito Mboweni because all of these individuals have benefited directly from their association with the systematic corruption of white monopoly capital. And that's Andy Lemkotama, president of Black First, the Land First, early on reacting to the latest development in the public protector's office. And just wrapping up, gentlemen, very briefly, it's about to people that in this country have been induced to believe this is the status quo uh, and this is how generally, uh, generation after generation, we're going to live. What, what message do you have? Look, any minister in the current cabinet or any member of parliament, whether regardless of which party they come from, if they are still in denial, if they believe that they are not up to the task, if they think that you know, this is too risky for them, they must please leave. We need people who can have the nerves of steel to take corrective action. It cannot be business as usual. If they can't do the job, if they think the heat is too uh, much in this kitchen, they must please leave and let those that can do the job come in. But we need change right now. Mzalele? Section 25 of the constitution of this country is not a land clause, it's a property clause. Land is just one of the properties. Our money is part of what must be uh, part of the assets that means must be returned. So therefore we're calling upon the African National Congress to do whatever it can to ensure that section 25 of the constitution is amended such that not only land that was forcefully taken away uh, is returned, but our monies that have been taken away by these institutions must also be returned. Yeah, and this is not a deflection from what everybody yeah. else no. uh, tends to consume themselves about. This is actually real issues of a redress that we, we need to tackle as a, as a country, Masir. Yes, this is, South Africa <coughs> deserves better. And uh, the crimes that have been committed are huge. This is a, the biggest crime that has been committed against us as South Africa. It's a commercial crime against us. It cannot prescribe. It's not a crime against me as an individual. It's not, it's not a civil matter between me and you. This is a, a, a crime against the state. It has to be paid. South Africa deserves better. Black people, as South, we say, they deserve much better. Their lives have got to improve. The economy has to improve. Employment has to come. Children deserve to go to school for free.
All right, so we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thanks indeed for joining us. And, of course, our esteemed panelists are discussing the public protector's uh, recommendations uh, regarding the EPSA bank having to pay, to pay uh, back the bailout that they incurred when uh, they acquired a bank corp. Thanks again for staying with us. We'll take a quick ad break. We're back after this.